Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Your Observatory Stellatube, the online astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. We're broadcasting live from the Alan I. Carswell Observatory located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Stellatube broadcast every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. local Toronto time. For any questions or comments you have of our past shows, or if you have any suggestions for future topics, please send us an email at observe at yorku.ca. And you can also connect with us on Twitter or Instagram with the handle at York Observatory and Facebook at Alan I. Carswell Ops. I am Matt, and I'll be one of your hosts this evening, along with Mahin, Arfa, Sergey, and Amin. We're also joined, we also have the pleasure to be joined, as a matter of fact, by York University's very own Professor Randy Lewis as our special guest speaker. And tonight we've got a great presentation by him about quarks, tetra quarks, and the possibility of dark matter quarks. Now, uh, before we start, the, York, uh, the, the observatory at York campus is in Toronto, and we would like to welcome you all and acknowledge the traditional land that our telescope is on. The observatory acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Sikaronto has been taken care of the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat and the Metis. It is now home to many indigenous people. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Our stargazing and astronomical efforts join the long history and current practices of astronomy for this land. The observatory looks forward to continuing to learn and revitalizing our knowledge in this area. And before we get started with our main show, uh, we want to give you a little update on what you can see this coming week. Tonight, Vega, Capella, Arcturus, and Venus will be visible tonight in the night sky. But we have talked a lot about Vega and Arcturus, so I think it's time for Capella to shine. And why wouldn't it? It's the sixth brightest star in the night sky. Also called Alpha Auriga, Capella is the brightest star in the constellation of Auriga the Charioteer. Now, an interesting fact about uh, it is that Capella is not only one star, but a binary system. It is composed of two G-type stars that orbit around each other every 104 days. Capella's astronomical history dates back to ancient Mesopotamia, where it, is, it was directly, directly related to an animal, the goat. And as a matter of fact, the word uh, Capella comes from the Latin word capra, or goat. Something interesting about this is that in some representations of Ariga, the charioteer, you'll see the chariot driver holding a goat, <laughs> but there are no actual myths combining both the charioteer and the goat. Um, and just like Sirius and the majority of uh, brightest stars in the night sky, you'll see Capella blinking and slightly changing colors from red to green, uh, but do not think that this is the star, like the, the star is not doing that. Instead, it is caused by the refraction of its really bright light coming through our atmosphere. And now that I think I've talked a, a lot about a capella, why don't we focus on smaller things than stars? Because in the world of science, big or, or small, everything is fundamental and fascinating, just like quarks and even the idea of dark matter quarks. I'm so excited to learn more about this. So why don't I let Arfa introduce us to our guest speaker who will be explaining this and so much more in tonight's presentation. Go ahead, Arfa. Thank you so much, Matt. So just a brief introduction of our guest speaker for today, Professor Randy Lewis. He grew up in a small house along Gravel Road uh, somewhere in Ontario. After getting a degree at the University of Guelph and University of Toronto for graduation, he worked at the Triumph Laboratory in Vancouver, then at the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility in USA. And after that, at the University of Regina, before moving to York University about 14 years ago. He's a theoretical physicist who studies quarks and other elementary particles, such as the ones he's going to be presenting today. We are really glad to have him here tonight, and many of our observatory crew were very excited for tonight, as they have had Professor Randy Lewis in classes at our very own York University. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Randy, for joining us today. Go ahead and the screen is all yours. Okay, thank you very much. I will get my slides up so you can all see them.
And I'll turn my camera on so you can all see me. Hopefully that works. Let me know if you see any problems. And thanks for having me on the show today. My topic comes in three parts, as you can see from the title, quarks, tetraquarks, and the possibility of dark matter quarks. You can think about this, if you like, as the past, the present, and the future. The past is about quarks, because people have known about quarks for several decades now. However, they do have unusual properties, and we don't think about them very much every day. So let's review some of the strange features of quarks, because that will be important to us for a discussion of what's happening today and what might happen in the future. Today is about tetraquarks. There's been a very recent discovery that I find particularly exciting, and I want to share that with you. And then the future might be the connection to astronomy and astrophysics, and that would be in the form of dark matter quarks. So let's get started. I'll tell you what I have planned, and then maybe you'll have questions for me. So let me start by pointing out that quarks really are a part of our everyday world, even though in our daily lives we don't really think about them. If you look around you right now at the walls of the room, the chair you're sitting on, the air you're breathing, and even you yourself, you know that all of that is made out of atoms. Every atom has electrons going around a small dense nucleus. The nucleus is made out of protons and neutrons. And the protons and neutrons are each made of quarks. To be precise, there are three quarks in every proton and there are three quarks in every neutron. Now, if you've heard about quarks before, you might even be able to name the six kinds of quarks. Let's see if I can name them. I'm gonna to try to name them in order from the lightest to the heaviest. There's the up quark and then the down quark, the strange quark and then the charm quark, the bottom quark and the top quark. Six kinds of quarks ordered from lightest to heaviest. And if you see on the screen now, the proton and the neutron that you and I are made of and everything in our everyday lives, they're made of up quarks and down quarks, the lightest kinds of quarks. The proton has two ups and a single down. The neutron has two downs and a single up. And so I suppose it's a natural question to ask, and many scientists are asking this question right now. If our regular world is made of regular quarks, could it be that dark matter is made of dark quarks? So I should remind you that dark matter is that mysterious thing that exists in our universe. It seems to be an important part of galaxies, but we have a very difficult time detecting it, except for seeing its gravitational effects. But given that our world is made of regular matter with quarks at its core, could it be that all of that dark matter has dark quarks at its core? To answer that question, we had better know as much as we can about quarks. And then we'll be able to ask the question, would something like dark quarks fit with our knowledge of dark matter or would it not fit? So that's an important question to get to. Let's get started by reminding ourselves of some of the strange properties of quarks. If I wanted to study a quark, now I should say I'm a theoretical physicist. So I don't go into labs and do experiments. I imagine experiments. I calculate things on my computer or with a pencil and paper. So here's the kind of experiment I would imagine doing. If I wanted to study a quark, I would take a proton because it has three quarks inside and I would reach in and pull one of those quarks out of the proton so I could study it on its own. So let me imagine doing that. This is my theorist experiment. I'm going to take a proton and hold it in my left hand. Of course, this doesn't make any sense. It's way too small. I wouldn't even be able to see where it was, but just in our imaginations, I'm gonna start with a proton in my left hand and I'm gonna reach in with my right hand, grab one of the quarks and pull it out. 
so that I can study it on its own. The amazing thing about quarks is that you can never do that. It's actually impossible, according to the theory, to get one quark all by itself. But what if I tried? I'm holding the proton, I reach in, I grab onto the up quark and I start pulling. And the up quark pulls back. Now at this point, my intuition comes from other forces that I understand. For example, if I have a refrigerator and a magnet attached to the refrigerator, I could grab onto the magnet and I could pull it off of the refrigerator. It would be hard work. I would have to pull because there's a magnetic force pulling it back, sticking it to the fridge. But if I pull hard enough, the magnet will come free and then I will just be able to hold it and move it around. The magnet doesn't really care about the refrigerator as long as I keep it far enough away. Once I get it close to the fridge, it sticks because there's a strong force there. Another force we know about, especially astronomers and astrophysicists, is gravity. And gravity behaves a lot like magnets. Maybe like me, you might be sitting on a chair right now. I have no problem sitting on my chair because gravity is pulling me down toward the planet. I could stand up, I could try to jump up into the air, but very quickly I would be pulled back down by the planet because I'm like a magnet and the planet is like the refrigerator and there's a rather strong force of gravity that keeps me on the surface of the planet. Probably you've noticed this too. You always seem to stick to the surface of the planet. But of course, if you got into a spaceship and blasted off far away from the planet, you could put your space suit on, you could go out of the spaceship, you could float around and you wouldn't have to worry about planet Earth much at all. Because once you get far enough away, the force is very weak. Just like when the magnet is far enough away from the refrigerator, the force is very weak. But let me come back to quarks because they behave nothing like that. I have a proton in my left hand. I reach in and grab one of the up quarks in the proton and I start pulling. And there's a strong force trying to prevent me from getting the quark out. But I'm a stubborn scientist, right? I keep pulling, I refuse to give up. And what happens? Well, I start to deform the proton. It's starting to look longer now. Maybe I should show you this next picture. If I move the slide forward, you can look in the top corner. Here's the proton I started with. And when I start pulling on one of the up quarks, the proton starts to look more like a football, an American style football. It's, it's long with one quark that I'm trying to pull away, but still there's this force between the pair of quarks and the single quark. And the harder I pull, the harder it pulls back, the force never gets weaker and weaker. And once my two hands are far enough apart, an amazing thing happens right in between in what looked to me like empty space, a brand new quark appears that wasn't there before. And a brand new anti-quark appears, which also wasn't there before. The new quark is going to rush to my left hand and join these two to become a new proton. And the new anti-quark is going to rush to my right hand and form what we call a meson. Every quark and every anti-quark together like this forms a meson. Well, that's a very interesting result, but it isn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to get a free quark. So I should take the meson, the quark anti-quark pair, and just set it on the desk and I can try again, reach into my proton, pull really hard on one of the quarks, and the same result will happen. I will get another meson, which I can put on my desk beside the first one, and I still have an entire proton in my left hand. I can keep doing this, and I can keep making a huge pile of mesons on my desk and I never lose the proton. I still have a proton, just like the one I started with. This sounds ridiculous. Where did all these mesons come from? And how can I get them for free and never lose the proton that I seem to be pulling them out of? But of course, then you remember the famous equation from Albert Einstein, E equals mc squared. I'm putting a lot of E, a lot of energy into my proton by pulling on it with my arm. 
all of that energy, that E is turning into MC squared. The M is the mass of all of these new quarks, the mass of all of the mesons that are now sitting on my desk in a pile that came from the energy put in due to our pulling with our arm in, in, in my little example. Nothing like this happens with gravity or with magnets, but it happens with the strong force among, among quarks. So quarks are very unusual and we have to build up our intuition all over again by doing physics experiments and physics calculations because it's not what we're used to in our daily lives. Down here at the bottom of the slide, I'm just reminding us then of the two types of particles that we can talk about. And these exist in all the textbooks. There are the baryons made of three quarks. So the proton is an example of a baryon. The neutron is an example of a baryon. They each have three quarks. And then there are the mesons with one quark and one antiquark. So you can have two quarks or you can have three quarks. Those are your options. Let's talk very specifically about one meson that's going to be important for the uh, discovery that was announced this month. And that meson that I want to describe in particular is the one that's made of one charm quark and one anti-charm quark. Now you remember the six quarks. Charm is one of the heavier ones. It's not the heaviest, but it's one of the heavier quarks, certainly a lot heavier than the ups and downs that we have in the proton and the neutron. So let me tell you a little bit about the meson that has a charm and an anti-charm. Here is a graph which shows the masses of mesons made of one charm and one anti-charm. Every yellow box and every gray box represents one charm anti-charm meson. Now you might think, why do they all have different masses? because the vertical axis here tells you how heavy the various mesons are. But I thought they all had the same quark and anti-quark inside of them. Why wouldn't they all have the same mass? Well, one answer is it depends what the, char the charm quark and the charm anti-quark are doing inside the meson. They might be orbiting each other. It reminds me of the binary star system that Matt was talking about a few minutes ago. They might be orbiting very quickly, or they might be orbiting very slowly, or they might be orbiting in an unusual pattern. These are the kinds of things that can make one charm anti-charm meson have a different mass or a different energy than some other charm anti-charm meson. And so if I look at this graph, you'll see 22 different boxes. Some of them are yellow, some of them are gray. Every one of these boxes represents one charm anti-charm meson. They have Greek names and letters and things. That's what the physicists like to call them. We don't care about the actual names in any detail. All of these boxes have been predicted by doing calculations from the theory. The yellow boxes have also been seen in experiments and those observations agree perfectly with the calculations from the theory. The gray boxes haven't been seen in experiment yet, but everybody is confident that they will be uh, soon when the experiments can be done because the theory tells us what those masses are and the theory works so well, everybody is confident that we understand mesons made out of a charm quark and an anti-charm quark. That's why people were really surprised when these red boxes were discovered. These red boxes represent particles that were found in real experiments at colliders. And they're very close to the yellow boxes and the gray boxes, but they are different particles. Nobody saw these coming. These were not predicted by the theory. In fact, we understand the theory very well of what a charm and an anti-charm quark together can form, a meson, and there is no room for these red boxes. They simply cannot be charm anti-charm mesons, at least not the traditional kind that we knew about. So what are they? That's the question. 
as a theoretical physicist, I would love to calculate what these red boxes should really be and what's going on inside of them using my computer. I might need a big computer, but that's okay. We can find big computers, they exist. The problem though, as I mentioned in this sentence on the side, is that the red boxes all happen to be near the top of the graph. I hate that. The reason I hate that is because our theoretical approach that we like best, where we use the true standard model equation and we calculate with a big computer, it requires us to start at the bottom of the graph. I have to get this one right, I have to get this one right, I have to get this one right. We have to get all the bottom ones right and work our way all the way up to where these strange new particles appear the red boxes. And that's really, really difficult to work from the bottom and get all the way up that high. Nevertheless, let's try to imagine what might be going on inside these red boxes. Here's an idea that is a very popular idea. And I think generally people agree with this now. Let's read the caption, cork soup. This comes from uh, a journal called Nature, an article published in the journal called Nature. Let's read it here together. Researchers at colliders in China and Japan have succeeded in making exotic matter comprising four quarks. Aha, uh -huh, there's the clue up to what these particles are. But are still debating whether the fleeting particles are meson pairs or true tetraquarks. So let's make sure we understand this. All of the textbooks that I look at tell me about baryons and mesons, things made of two quarks and things made of three quarks. They never mention things made of four quarks, but now such things have been discovered. These colliders, initially in China and Japan and subsequently in other countries as well, are seeing exotic matter. It's the red boxes on the previous graph. And the idea is that they have four quarks inside of each one. If I flip back, you'll remember that the red boxes are very close to the yellow and the gray boxes. That leads us to believe that the red boxes have one charm quark and one anti-charm quark, just like the yellow and gray boxes, plus an extra quark and an extra anti-quark that's very, very light, probably up quarks and down quarks. Their masses are so small that the red boxes don't get shifted up very much by adding such light quarks. So now the question is, what are these four quark objects really? What are the quarks inside them doing? Because if you're like me, you might get very excited. Oh, a new particle, nobody's ever heard of this before. It's not in the textbooks. Four quarks inside of a single particle. That sounds exciting. And then you might say, wait a minute. If I had two mesons, that would be four quarks. There would be a quark and an antiquark in one of the mesons and a quark and an antiquark in one of the other mesons. That wouldn't be so exciting. Could it be that the red boxes are just a meson molecule, two mesons orbiting around one another? Maybe it is. Some physicists think that this is an explanation of the red boxes. Other, other physicists think, no, it's a true tetraquark. Tetra means four. So it's a true tetraquark where all four objects bind to each other very strongly. It's a difficult question to answer because as I said, you have to start at the bottom of the graph and work your way up. Let me mention, that China and Japan are not the only places that do these experiments. Another place is the Large Hadron Collider, for example, in Geneva, Switzerland. Maybe you've heard of the Large Hadron Collider. It's famous for discovering the Higgs boson. That happened in 2012. But did you know that the Higgs, that the Higgs boson is not the only particle that has been discovered at the Large Hadron Collider? There are, in fact, 62 other particles that have been discovered so far at the Large Hadron Collider. And chances are there will be more. Here's a graph that shows all of the new particles, 62 of them, according to when they were discovered at the Large Hadron Collider. 
you see that one was discovered in 2011, three were discovered in 2012, and so on, right up to this year, there have been eight new particles discovered so far in 2021. Of these 62 particles, I only want to tell you about my favorite one, and that's the one that was announced earlier this month in a paper posted by the LHCB collaboration working at the Large Hadron Collider and posted in September of 2021. Here is a graph of their results. We don't have to worry too much about the details, but I'll just tell you that the horizontal axis of this graph is the energy and the vertical axis is how many events they, sat, they found in their detector, how many counts they had at that particular energy. So if you look at all the little black data points, they go up and down a little bit, but basically it looks like a horizontal line until you get here where there's a giant bump and the black data points go way up and come way back down and then it's somewhere near zero again. This signature of a bump of many counts at a particular energy is the indication that there is a particle made of quarks that has that particular energy for its mass, its mc squared. So this is the graph of their discovery. And the reason it's my favorite is that this tetraquark or this object made of four quarks is not one charm plus one anti-charm plus a couple of light things. It's two charm quarks, no anti-charm, plus a very a couple of light things, an anti-up and an anti-down. Those are the two light things. But this makes it very uh, happy for me because if we went back and made a new graph, you remember the graph we had with the yellow boxes and the red boxes and the gray boxes? And the red boxes were all really high. This new discovery this month would be like a red box on a new graph, the graph with two charm quarks rather than one charm and one anti-charm. And this red box would be at the bottom of the graph. This is the perfect place for theoretical physicists like me to try and study it. That's why it's my favorite. So you might ask, okay, is this one a tetra quark? with the two charms and the anti-up and the anti-down all tightly bound in a single particle? Or is it more like a molecule or a binary star where one charm is partnered with anti-up and the other charm is partnered with anti-down as two separate particles? I was at a workshop a couple of weeks ago where physicists were excitedly discovering, uh, discussing this new discovery and I think it's fair to say that no consensus is reached yet. People are busily working to understand whether this is a tetraquark or a meson molecule, but it will take time to do it carefully and to find a consensus. So it's a very exciting time to be watching this tetraquark and quark physics. Let me tell you just a moment about what we're doing here at York University. I'm not the only person at York that's involved in this. We have a group who are doing our theoretical calculations. And what we're looking at is a related tetraquark. It still has the anti-up and the anti-down, but instead of a pair of charm quarks, we're studying the case with a pair of bottom quarks. You might remember the bottom quark is even heavier than charm. According to our calculations, that makes this tetraquark even more strongly bound an even more stable particle than the one that was just discovered. We're certainly hoping that future experiments can discover this doubly bottomed particle so that we can study that as well. And it's been fun to work on the calculations already. And I should say that in addition to our group at York University, there are people in India working on this. There are people in Europe working on this. There are people in the United States working on it. A lot of effort is going into this doubly bottomed tetraquark study. So I only want to take a couple more minutes of your time. But one thing I do want to make sure of 
is that I don't leave you with the impression that pictures like the one you see on the screen right now are really our theory for quarks. This looks like a really very simple object. I mean, how hard can it be, right, for me to do a theory calculation, three or four little circles inside of a bigger circle? Doesn't look that hard. But of course, really, the life of quarks is much more complicated than the pictures I've been showing. So just to give you another example, let me show you an artist's representation of a proton made by someone at Brookhaven National Lab. This is their suggestion for a way to imagine a proton. It looks like a much busier place inside this proton, and that's the point they're trying to make. If we do look carefully, you see a red ball here that represents one of the quarks. And then there's a blue ball over here, which is a second quark. And back there, there's a green ball, which is a third quark. So we expect three quarks inside of a proton, two ups and a down, and, and those are the three. But notice that they're held together by springs representing gluons, which are a part of the strong force that holds this proton together. But then there are other quarks and other antiquarks held together by other gluons. And there are gluons that don't have any quarks. And there are quarks that don't have any gluons. It's a very complicated place inside of a proton. So how do we do these calculations? And how do we have any confidence that the calculations we're doing are correct? But well, let me show you what we do just in one picture. The idea is to take your complicated proton or meson or tetrachor, whatever you want to study, and imagine that it is in a grid. I want you to break space and time up into these little cubes. And then in our computer, we're going to calculate the quantum fields for the quarks, for the antiquarks, and for the gluons in every one of these little cubes and on every one of these sites and every one of these little line segments on the entire lattice. Some of these little cubes are inside the proton, some of them are outside the proton, we calculate everywhere. You're going to need a big computer, but that's okay, we have some. Right? Computers are getting bigger all the time. So these are the kinds of ways we do the calculations so that we can be confident of our results for quarks and for tetraquarks. So the final slide I want to show you comes back to the question of dark matter. We've been talking about regular quarks, which makes up regular matter, the matter that you are built of and the air you're breathing and the room you're sitting in. Could dark matter be made of dark quarks? Here's a picture that comes from an experiment that was done by a different collaboration, also working at the Large Hadron Collider. And they were hunting for dark matter quarks, the dark quarks. The idea of their experiment goes like this. They said, according to astronomy, and you all know about astronomy, according to astronomy, there's more dark matter in our universe than there is regular matter, but not way, way more. The amount of dark matter and the amount of regular matter is actually not so different. Could this be a clue, is what the people in this study were saying. In particular, maybe we should imagine that there's some sort of new force and a new boson, and maybe this new boson or new particle couples to one regular quark and one dark matter quark. If that happened, it would naturally lead us to have approximately equal numbers of regular quarks and dark quarks. And maybe that is a helpful theory to explore since in astronomy, we really do seem to see approximately equal mass densities of regular matter and dark matter. If that were the case, then these people said, well, we should be able to make these particles at the Large Hadron Collider. We have enough energy when, I, when we crash our two proton beams together that we could make one of these new bosons. And it would then decay into a dark quark and a dark, and a 
it would decay into a regular quark and a dark quark. Sorry, that's what they're supposed to do. And when they did the calculations, they said, okay, we're going to have, according to the theory, two of these new particles coming out. Each one goes into a regular uh, quark and a dark quark. So we'll have four jets together. And you can see four jets streaming out from one point here. They go in four different directions. Two of these came from one of our new bosons. So one of them would be a dark quark jet and one of them would be a normal quark jet. And the other two also came from the other new boson. So it would be one dark jet and one regular jet. But of course you say, wait a minute, if it's a dark jet, how would I see it? According to the theory, the dark jet, you wouldn't see initially. It would move some distance away from the collision point and then it would decay into regular quarks, regular particles, and then you would see the jet only starting later. We can't tell by this simple artist's picture here, but when they studied the experiment in detail, they did not find any dark quarks. And this is very useful. They were able to rule out some models of dark quarks, but they could not rule out others. So the question remains whether dark matter is or is not containing dark quarks. But based on what we know of regular quarks so far, people are really starting to ask and answer this question, both theoretically and experimentally. All right, that's all the time I want to take from you. Maybe you have questions for me. I'm happy to do my best to answer any questions you have. Thanks for your time. And I'm going to turn the screen back over to Matt. Thank you so much for such an amazing presentation. Like Professor Randy, I've been your students from Physics 1010. And right now, even I'm studying quantum physics, I was really scared of taking quantum physics. But when I knew it was you who was teaching it, I was like, yes, it's going to be a great year now. So thank you so much. Like, just like your lectures, the presentation was so much like interesting and informative. Thank you so much. All right, I just have a, a few questions that I uh, on top of my mind. It's like, first of all, is it possible that there will be subpart two quarks as in like, for example, in, in the beginning years, um, we thought atom is the smallest uh, thing to exist and then it came, came in quarks. Is there a possibility that in future we will be like, okay, like quarks and their inner part that make up a quark like that, that give it the properties of a quark? Is it possible or that's, that's the limit that we see? Yes, it's possible. We have no indication of any substructure inside a quark yet, but that doesn't mean it's not there. For at the deepest level that we can probe, quarks look as if they have nothing inside of them, that they're just point particles with no deeper structure. But of course, if we can probe more deeply, we may discover something different in the future. So you're right, we simply don't know yet. All right, thank you so much. And I also have one more question. So I know we aren't able to extract quarks at this moment, but what if we are able to, and we are able to handle like each one of them, is it possible that we in on living on this planet Earth will be able to make new atoms with different properties or like even antimatter or something like that? This is one of the very interesting things about quarks. That's a good question that you raise. There are many, many, many different things we can make from quarks. A long list on one of the slides, we saw 22 different things we could make using just a charm quark and an anti-charm quark. So if you let me use three quarks, as I see in your picture here, there are many, many more than 22 things we can make. We have different kinds of quarks. We can make all kinds of things. However, if I take 
two up quarks and a down quark, much like you have in your picture here, that forms a proton. And a proton is a very happy thing where all of the strong forces tend to stay inside the proton. So if I then go ahead and make an atom, say I want to make a helium atom, the nucleus of that helium atom will have two protons and two neutrons. If I'm thinking about quarks, I might say, wow, that's a lot of quarks. Three times four is 12 quarks inside the nucleus of a helium atom. Imagine all of the things that 12 quarks could do inside the nucleus of a helium atom. And yet, they always stay very strongly grouped into their threes. A proton here, a proton there, a neutron here, and a neutron there. And so this is the interesting uh, connection between particle physics and nuclear physics. Particle physics lets us talk about quarks inside of protons and neutrons. But a lot of nuclear physics says, I don't really have to worry about quarks because I know what up and down quarks will do. They will form protons and neutrons. And then I can do a lot of interesting and important and practical nuclear physics only by talking about the protons and neutrons. So I like how you think. You're thinking, let's build something exciting and new that we haven't seen before with quarks. And yes, we can do that, but it's difficult because they often want to rearrange themselves into the traditional protons and neutrons. That's their favorite uh, configuration to have. Thank you so much, Professor. I guess my team have more questions for you. Thank you, Arfa. Um, so I have two questions. So uh, my first question is, um, is there a possibility of quarks being directly observed in the near future since they haven't really been observed yet, even though they are supported by experimentation and theory? This is a really important question. Yes, I'm glad you asked this. If the question, if we interpret this question to mean, can I ever get a quark all by itself and observe it directly, sitting alone, just a quark? The answer seems to be no, we cannot do that because it will always be strongly bound to neighboring quarks. And even if the other quarks are far away, new quarks will appear so that it always has a nearby neighbor. That just seems to be how quarks work. So we can never get it alone. However, the way I like to think about it is that we have observed quarks directly. It's just that we've observed them in their natural habitat. We've seen them inside protons and neutrons. We can measure whether there is a strange quark inside a proton or whether there isn't. And in fact, now and then there is a strange quark inside a proton and that kind of thing really can be measured. So in that sense, we can actually see individual quarks and their effects inside of their natural habitat, their hadrons that they live in like protons and neutrons, but we'll never get one on its own. I see, thank you. So um, I also have another question. So when we talk about quarks, we usually think, you know, they're so small. So it makes us wonder, like, is it the smallest thing in the universe or is there anything smaller than quark, whether it is particle wise or just generally? I would love to have an answer to this question. I think this is a good example where particle physicists and astronomers and astrophysicists have to team up and really tackle questions like this. The short answer is we don't know. Speaking as a particle physicist, I usually start with the standard model of particle physics as my starting point for calculations. And in that theory, quarks are treated as a point particle with no size at all. Electrons are treated the same way. Neutrinos are treated the same way. So these things are all considered equally tiny and so tiny that I don't know uh, how to measure them at all. 
Is one of them smaller than the other? Presently, we have no idea, no information. Which one is the smallest? Or is there something we haven't discovered yet that's the smallest? I don't know, but I'd love to know. Please keep thinking about it and we should discuss clever ideas to try and answer this question. Thank you for your explanation. I hope we discover it soon. Um, I think Amin will go next with his questions. Yes, hello, Professor. So my first question is, how is it possible for a quark to have a fraction of a charge or a spin? Yeah, this is a very nice question. You've written down in your nice table here, the charges of the quarks. Some of them are plus two thirds and some of them are minus one third. And these are definitely fractions and that might seem weird. I guess I have to remember that when you say, or when this table says that the charge of the up quark is minus two thirds, what we really mean is that it is minus two thirds times the size of the electron charge, which is some number of coulombs. And I think many of you will even remember the, the numerical value for how many coulombs gives the charge of an electron. And, and when I type out the full number in coulombs, then every particle's charge is a strange fraction or decimal number, including the electron. So really the question becomes, and I think this is your question and it's a good one, why do the quarks have fractional charges compared to the electron? If the electron has one unit of charge, which is some strange number of coulombs, why is it that the up quark doesn't have one or that the down quark doesn't have one? but instead it has two thirds or, or one third. The answer is, I don't know. I also don't know why the electron has its charge, but I will say there are some interesting and important relationships between the charges of the quarks and the charges of the electrons. And the standard model has these built in. You might remember but the standard model talks about the electric charge and the magnetic charge. It actually treats those together as the electromagnetic force, a combined force. And then there's the weak force as well. And, and the standard model combines those into the electroweak force. And then we have the strong force. And I wonder, you might think, perhaps it's no accident that the charges of the quarks all come in thirds minus one third plus two thirds. And there are also three colors, you might have heard, three colors of quark. That is in fact, no accident. So there are these interesting deep connections between having three colors and a charge with a one third in the denominator. But the short answer to your question is, all of this is true, but we don't really have a deep explanation a really, really satisfying explanation for any of it yet. So that brings me to our next question, which is what is a color charge? It's like you read my mind. Yes, great question. If I were to try and explain color charge, I think I would go back to electrons because they feel an electric force and they have a charge. Each electron can, or each particle can have a positive charge or a negative charge, or it could be zero. But for electric charge, there's one kind of charge, positive or negative. Quarks have three kinds of charges. Red is one of them. So you could have a positive red charge or a negative red charge. You might think of it as red and anti-red. That's one kind of charge, but they also have another kind of charge, green. And it can be green or it can be anti-green. And then there's a blue, which can be blue or anti-blue. And the strong force between quarks that seems so not intuitive to me is a consequence of having these three kinds of charges, whereas the electron has only one kind. It's positive or negative, and that's all it can do. But quarks, they can be 
red and positive or negative and green and positive or negative and blue and positive and negative. And, and these multiple colors make the force so much stronger and so much more complicated, to be honest, than, than just the electric force that we're used to. Thank you, Amin, for these questions. And thank you, Professor uh, Lewis, for your very fascinating presentation. So my first question is, what are the applications of quarks? I love this question because I don't really have a clue how to answer it. One of the nice things about quarks is that they are so much at the frontier that we haven't really, I guess, industry applications perhaps haven't caught up yet. I would like to think that they will. It wasn't so long ago that nuclear physics seemed like something that only academic scientists and laboratories were interested in. But of course, now we have nuclear medicine and nuclear power and all sorts of ways that nuclear physics gets used. This is the next level. Inside the nucleus, we have these individual protons and neutrons, which are bags of quarks. What will we use them for in the future? I think I will have to leave that for your generation of scientists to uncover. Think up interesting applications of quarks for the future. I think the only limitation is our imagination. But the good news is we're getting so confident of our understanding of quarks now that we can really have good discussions about their properties in detail and hopefully there will be practical applications in the future. I have two questions about the standard model. The first one is asked by Syed Hassan in YouTube chat, um, which is how many of the 62 discovered subatomic particles alongside the Higgs boson are represented in the standard model and how many were not predicted? Very nice question. All of the 62 are particles that are made of quarks. So in the standard model picture that I see nicely here on the screen, there are in purple, the six quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. And all of these 62 particles are built from two or three or four quarks. Uh, I believe the specific question was asking about um, how many of them were, or, or how many of them were not predicted as well, including. Ah, uh, that's a good point. So the first part of the question was how many of these new particles uh, are not in the standard model? So I was thinking none of these new 62 particles gets its own box in the table that I see on your screen here. The Higgs boson, it gets its own box. It's a fundamental particle all by itself in the standard model. The other 62 are built from pieces that are shown on your screen. How many of the 62 were predicted ahead of time and how many caught us by surprise? I don't actually know exactly how many of each category there were in the 62, but there were certainly several of both. I can think of one, which was a baryon made of two charm quarks plus a light quark. That is one that I had calculated many years ago and many other people had as well. Our paper was published way back in 2001. And then later on that particle was found at the Large Hadron Collider. So nobody was surprised to see that one arrive. On the other hand, there was this particle discovered this month, which appears to be a tetraquark or something like that. That one was surprising for us. So there were certainly some of both among the 62, some surprises and some not surprising at all. Excellent, thank you. And one last question is, what is the future of the Saturn model? I really like this question because it's a, it's a question all particle physicists are asking themselves right now, I would say. 
before the Higgs boson was discovered, the standard model looked exactly like you have in the chart on the screen, minus the Higgs boson. And everybody, many, many people were excited about all the new particles that might have to be added to the standard model. And we might have to invent new forces and think about new uh, explanations because the standard model was going to fail. That's what everybody was hoping to see, to be honest. It's really fun when the standard model fails because then you get to think of a new theory and you have a new starting point and, and whole new experiments to do. But when the Large Hadron Collider found the Higgs boson, just like the standard model said it would be, and they didn't find any new boxes with new particles that we need to add to this picture, we found lots of things made of quarks, but nothing to go beside the quarks. Well, then the annoying part is that the standard model works so incredibly well. It's hard to know what to do. Right? What do you do if your model is not broken? It works beautifully. And I think I'd really like to come back to all of you who are interested in astronomy and astrophysics, because I hope you will look at the standard model and say, aha, I see something that's missing. There's no dark matter particle in this chart. If dark quarks exist, we have to expand the standard model to include dark quarks. If dark quarks don't exist, then we have to add, expand the standard model so that it includes whatever else the dark matter really is made of, because dark matter is out there. Astronomers know that, and it's made of something. And whatever it's made of, it's not in our standard model. It's not in our picture yet. So I, I hope that can be a future for the standard model. It has to have a dark sector added to it because it's absent, but astronomers know that those dark particles are out there. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Professor Randy Lewis for being here with us. And well, everyone, you have been listening to the Alan I. Carswell Observatory's weekly tele to broadcast the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. Thank you once again to Professor Randy Lewis, the guest speaker this evening for such an intriguing talk. It was great having you here. And the hosts this evening have been Arfa, I mean, Sergey, Matt and Mahin. Make sure to leave any comments or questions in the comment section of the video and talk to us in the chat right now. We will be around for the next 20 minutes to answer your questions. All of our programs are free, but if you would like to make a donation, see our website at observatory.info.yorku.ca. You can always connect with us on Twitter with the handle at York Observatory and check out our website for show notes, content, updates, and contact info at observatory.info.yorku.ca. And thanks for tuning in, clear skies and have a great night.